Hi, I'm Steve Levin, Security Best Practices Lead at Palo Alto Networks. Welcome to the next video in our series about quantum computing and its impact on security. With me again are two of our Palo Alto Networks quantum technology and cryptography experts, Richu and Phil. Our first five sessions focused on the security threat from quantum computers, the impact of threats from cryptographically relevant quantum computers, planning the transition to a quantum resistant network, and what you can do to protect your business now, post-quantum cryptography and quantum key distribution. Today's session focuses on quantum random number generators. So the concept of using a quantum random number generator may be new for a lot of people. Phil, can you tell us what types of RNGs are available and what benefits a QRNG may offer us over what we're using today? Absolutely, Steve. If you take a look at this slide here, there's really three different types of RNGs or random number generators. Definitely the most popular one and the, most one, the one that's most widely used is what we call a pseudo-random number generator. And they're a software random number generator that's involved in many operating systems as well as appliances and things like that that you purchase today. These random number generators are typically based on a mathematical formula, so they're deterministic, but they take a random seed generally from something like environmental noise to provide that randomness. So they've been around for a long, long time, but some of the negatives or the cons with this technology is that they are program generated, as I said, they are deterministic, and therefore, a significant you know, quantum computer with AI and things like that might have the ability to reverse engineer these random numbers, Steve, and then figure out the keys. And so potentially there's a, a massive vulnerability for it in the future. And so therefore they're probably less of an ideal situation when we, when we think about quantum security and what we should be doing. Now the second type is called a true random number generator, or TRNG. Again, this is extremely mature technology, but it's appliance space and it takes in environmental noise like thermal fluctuations, power fluctuations and things like that, Steve. And that's how they generate the random numbers. So there's no deterministic formula per se. So the cons in this type of technology is that it's definitely lower capacity because it has to take in environmental noise. And these uh, classical physics can actually be guessed or reversed engineered. And in fact, if you take a look at some of the negatives out there, just recently some of the studies were saying if you pass strong electromagnetic interference through these boxes or if you raise the temperature to a certain degrees, then you can manipulate the ones and zeros that are coming out of the box that makes up the pseudo random. So the last one is called the quantum random number generator, and this is the latest technology. And the reason why we believe that this is superior to the other two technologies is that it's based on quantum physics or the laws of nature. And so we're using photons or elements of lights refracting within a prism or something like that on a chip, and it's randomly scattering these photons which are then collected and they make up uh, the random number, Steve. And so these types of technologies, there's no known quantum vulnerability to them. However, there are some downsides. It's a new technology. They've only been around for about a decade or so, so they're not widely used. But as we see the quantum security ramp up, we believe QRNGs will also ramp up as well. The other thing is that there are, uh, you know, an additional cost. It's an additional hardware component. It's not free like a PRNG, and so you have to budget for it. And uh, the last one here is that not all of these solutions may be FIP certified or, or specifically certified for your application. So you have to check the government mandates and things like that and what certifications these technologies have. Well, from my understanding, most applications today use pseudo, uh, pseudo random number generators, the PRNGs. And that's usually local to the application, uh, for example, the operating system's random number generator. Now, Richu. If we want to use entropy from a QRNG that's based on quantum principles, how can we do that today? Yeah, Phil just compared the different sources of entropy that we've been using um, and to the newest, that's the quantum random number generator, or QRNG, which is based on photonics principle. This source of randomness will become essential to generating strong keys that are quantum attack resistant. It's not just the ciphers migration to PQC, and their hard mathematical computation that's going to help, but the seed material that goes into generating the keys that will also need to be hardened. And for that, we have a new era of entropy source. Quantum entropy is provided by an external photonic source in the form of a QRNG chip or a PCIe board generating entropy in either kilo to megabit range. 
And then there are also the QRNG appliances generating a very large amount of entropy in the gigabit range. One of these form factors are typically sought out for streaming quantum entropy to either hardware servers in data centers or to other remote lo locations today. And it's especially used for highly confidential SSL or VPN communications that need such higher entropy. Other cases have also been seen that we've seen are QKD, quantum key distribution devices that have a built-in QRNG chip or a PCIe board when they're used for site-to-site -site VPN communications. Um, some of the popular hardware vendors, of, of course, for QRNG are ID Quantique. They're largely known for their chip, their PCIe board as well as appliances, especially adopted in the Asia Pacific or the North America regions. And then you have Quintessence Lab, another vendor also known for their PCIe boards. A few other mentions here, uh, specifically a larger adoption in the European market are for QSide for their PCIe board and chips and Crypto Labs for their OEM solutions. Today's options for QRNG PCIe or even uh, appliances uh, is, is somewhat critical because general purpose CPUs do not support QRNG today. And there's work still being done to explore if a PCIe board can be retro-installed into some of the older hardware, but still a very long way to go. So for the end-user devices, there's, there's, some, um, there's some progress there that we can talk about, which is Samsung's Galaxy 3 and 4 smartphones, which are handheld devices, come with a QRNG chip embedded, but for very specific use case. They're used for master key encryption only and for some select applications. I also want to highlight that it is very simple for the industry to adopt a QRNG source, especially with a standardized secure API or SDK that can integrate with the QRNG vendor. It's now up to the network vendor or the server applications to support these API calls uh, in their operating system. So this helps then make the streaming of the quantum randomness somewhat seamless and easier. Also, connecting to a large set of vendors becomes a lot more straightforward. So Steve, besides that, we have hardware, besides the hardware supplies, I mean, of course, there are companies that are built on the premise of QRNG as an entropy cloud source. These are called entropy as a service companies. These companies host a multiple of hardware QRNGs somewhere in a data center or a co-location, and they're able to stream the, the sources of random from each of these vendors, cache them in their cloud service, and then deliver it to an endpoint device on demand. Uh, some of the entropy as a service vendors that I want to mention are Quantropy and Crypt. And I also want to call out Quantinium. They're somewhat uniquely positioned since their source of entropy is from their own quantum computer with a high qubit fidelity generating streams of randomness. So even though these cloud entropy vendors exist, I have to say standards for EAS are still undecided. In fact, cryptographers from NIST and other global standard bodies are still evaluating if there are any security implications to streaming seed material on an insecure network like the internet. So for existing hardware or newer hardware of network devices um, and as well as servers, integrated QRNG or an on-prem QRNG appliance is the only good option that we have. Um, but then I also have to think about what about all the other handheld devices or smart devices or personal devices that we use? How are they going to leverage the quantum entropy? So some, sometime down in the future, we will have to figure out an alternative. And I think perhaps the entropy as a service, which is the cloud delivered entropy, could just be an, a good alternate option there. Wow, Ruchu, with all these variations, is anyone actually working on standardization? Yeah, absolutely. So the NIST SP800-90 series of documents supports the generation of high quality random bits for cryptographic and non-cryptographic use. 90A specifies deterministic random bit generator, the DRBG mechanisms based on cryptographic algorithms. 90B, provides guidance for the development and validation of entropy sources. And then 90C has the specifications for implementing the RBGs that include DRBG. 90A specifies a deterministic random bit generator, the DRBG mechanisms based on cryptographic algorithms. 
90B provides guidance on the development and the validation of these entropy sources. And then 90C has specifications for implementing the RBGs that include DRBG mechanisms from 90A. And it also uses the entropy sources uh, mechanisms from 90B. To summarize, 90C goes into the detail for the three classes of RBGs, the entropy device that is initialized from an external RBG, entropy source that's available on demand, entropy source that is continuously accessed to provide output with full entropy. So today's most quantum, ent quantum entropy providers are leaning on NIST SP800-90C to define the construction of RBGs as well as the use of the entropy source itself. Well, a lot of our audience may be asking if this is all really necessary. Since there hasn't been any widespread evidence that PRNGs are not sufficient for producing good keys. So what are your thoughts around this, Phil? Is this just a solution looking for a problem or is it actually a problem? You know, Steve, if we take a look at history, right, there's been a couple of, you know, I would say prevalent reports that we need to take a look at to answer that question. And so the first one I want to kind of bring our audience's attention to is the one that was done in 2012. And this is a study done and you know, titled Mining Your P's and Q's. If you haven't seen it, I, I highly suggest our audience go and take a look at this. It's an eye opener. Uh, what the audience uh, should understand is that this study was done on real world SSL and TLS servers. And so uh, the studiers took a look at 12 million uh, of these different sites and this is what they found. And so I thought this graph sort of summarized everything kind of nicely. And this is a lot of numbers and the ones that I want to really bring out here are in these red boxes. And so if you take a look at these and you take a look at the percentages of the TLS servers and the SSL uh, uh, servers that were impacted, you could see that you know some of them are fairly low numbers. You know they're below one percent, and all of these uh, things that were caused by you know weak entropy. If you had weak entropy, basically you couldn't produce very unique keys, Steve. Okay. And so this brought us back to the problem of repetitive keys. And so generally, when you're out there to crack an encryption key, if you have things that repeat, then you can find patterns and you can use mathematical formulas to guess the factorization numbers that went into those keys, right? And so that's exactly how they're breaking them. So if we were doing our jobs right and we were truly using high quality entropy, all of these numbers should be zero, right? So here's another uh, you know, study that was done a little bit more recently and this one was done by Key Factor. And again, this one took a look at what was out there actually being used in a production world. And we took a look at many IoT devices and many networking devices. And what we found here was that poor random caused a one in every 72 RSA certificates to become vulnerable. And again, the weak entropy, basically repeated entropy and things like that, went into producing specific keys in these certificates that could be reverse engineered by something called a GCD or, or a general common denominator type of, type of function, right? And so as much as we like to believe that this doesn't happen as often as we like, we can see by these two examples, Steve, that they, there is a lot of devices out there that are impacted. And so I did a little bit of further poking around and just in the last, say, you know, 12 odd years or so and said, how prevalent does this happen? And so we're not picking on any one technology here, but these are actual dates and facts and the companies that were affected, right? So you saw Debian OpenSSL affected, things like PlayStation 3, the one in 2012 was a study that I just talked about. But even things like Bitcoin and large company uh, routing systems like Cisco and even security companies are also impacted. So if, if the random isn't good enough, it does cause security issues further down the line. Well, this is really fascinating stuff. And uh, you've really shown us how several studies have, uh, have shown that the weak random can affect the quality of our ability to keep data private. So are there similar weaknesses on the uh, symmetric encryption side? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question, right? At the beginning of this video series, you <clears> saw <throat> that Rishu and I talked about some of the things that can affect both the asymmetric side as well as the symmetric side. And the general belief, you know, like four or five years ago was if you basically upgraded your AES from a lower key quality like an AES-128 and you bump that back up to the maximum quality of AES-256, mm -hmm. you were secured from Grover's algorithm. So that was a belief until this study came out. And this is from ATIS, which is a telecom industry, and they're 
report is extremely eye-opening. What they did is they ran a bunch of studies and mathematical uh, tests against the ability of Grover's algorithm to physically break AS-256. And what they found out was increasing key size from something like AS-128 to AS-256 was only one simple factor. And the factor that made a bigger improvement in, in resistance to Grover's was the actual quality and the number of security bits of the random number. So let's have a look at some of the graphs that came out of the report that sort of proves their study. If we take a look at this graph, you could see that on the y-axis, we have time. And take a look at the measure of time. It's based on a base of 10, uh, of 10 and so it goes up rather quickly. But on the x-axis, we have the number of entropy bits, and these are good quality entropy bits. And you'll see that there's a major inflection point around 220 bits. And so when we get past 220 security bits, you can see astronomically it takes so much more time for Grover's algorithm to break AS-256. And so their best practice was to use at least 256 bits of good entropy to go generate these keys. Now, we also know that there's a lot of noise in the early qubits. We talked about that in our previous uh, you know, videos, and Rishi and I pointed this out, that basically says that this early technology, the qubits are not good quality, and therefore we have to invest in things like qubit correction and things like that make the qubit quality better. So this study also takes a look at good quality qubits versus poor quality qubits and said, if we were to run Grover's algorithm on these type of machines, how fast can we break AS-256? And so having a look at these two graphs that I'm showing you right now, the one on the left has time on the y-axis, the one on the right has the number of qubits on the y-axis, and then we have the number of entropy bits on the x-axis again. You'll see that if we're using a small number of entropy bits, it doesn't matter. These two lines of good quality versus low quality qubits are fairly close together. And as you move beyond 220 to 250 bits of entropy, you can start seeing the lines starting to separate. Now, the separation in this, these graphs are fairly small, but again, you have to take a look at what the y-axis is measured in. So once you get past 250 bits, say, of good quality entropy, it takes a lot more time and it takes a lot more qubits in order for Grover's to really get a hold and, and break AS-256. So uh, this sort of proves that entropy makes a big difference in resisting a quantum attack. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Richu, for giving us the context to understand the difference between QRNGs and other RNGs, and when and why you would want to use a QRNG as soon as possible. Today we discuss the benefits and drawbacks of different types of RNGs and how the weak entropy of PRNGs places private keys at risk. We also learned how to start using a QRNG today if you need to protect long-lived data that could still be valid when cryptographically relevant quantum computers arrive on the scene. So thanks for joining us for this series of videos about quantum computing and its effects on cryptography and your data security. And thank you, Phil, and thank you, Richu for all the valuable information and context you've given us on a vast array of quantum security subject. I hope you all have a better understanding of what quantum computing is and the threats it poses, how to secure VPNs and TLS traffic today, the importance of developing a quantum readiness plan and a quantum inventory, post-quantum cryptography, quantum key distribution, and quantum random number generators. Stay tuned as we expand this series to cover more quantum concepts. And stay safe, everyone. Quantum's coming faster than you think.